Thank you, this is amazing. I am um, unbelievably special to be here today. I'm a Massachusetts kid, and to be presenting in front of the UMass Amherst sign for TEDx. To think 15 years ago, I pulled in on this campus on a bus to play UMass, and to think 15 years ago, I scored 30 points, I was player of the game, live on ESPN. And to think 15 years later, <laughs> be easy, my man. <laughs> and to think 15 years later, I'm back to share my story and back to share my struggle. You know, I've traveled all across the country and dedicated my life over the last three years sharing my story. And I do it, I do it to make a difference. I do it to prevent one kid, one family from going down the road that I went down. I do it because I remember what it was like sitting in seats, listening to people present. And I remember, I remember saying I'll never be like that guy. See, I grew up in Forever, Massachusetts, three hours from here. My father, a politician. My mom, a hard worker. My brother, a big time high school basketball star. I grew up under his shadow that pressure, and they told me growing up as a kid that I'd never be as good as him. They told me I could not score 2,000 points. They told me that McDonald's All-Americans don't come for Fall River. They told me that the posters on my walls of Boston Celtics were a joke. They told me 6'1 white kids don't make it to the NBA. They were wrong. What I wish they told me I wish they told me because alcoholism and addiction ran in my family that I was 40 times more likely to suffer from it. I wish they told me that 90% of all addictions begin in the teenage years. I wish they told me that the first page of every addict's story is the red solo cup in the blunt. See, at 18 years old, I stepped on the campus of Boston College. And at 18 years old, I opened my dorm room one night. And at 18 years old, I saw a pile of cocaine. And at 18 years old, I was offered one line. And at 18 years old, I promised myself that that one line would be a one-time deal. I wish they told me that one line could last 14 years. I wish they told me that one line would get me expelled from Boston College four months later. See, at 22 years old, I reached my dream. I became the poster the Celtic on the wall. But at 22 years old, I was introduced to this thing they called OxyContin. And at 22 years old, they told me it was 40 milligrams, and they told me it cost $20. I wish they told me that that $20 was going to turn to $25,000 a month drug habit. I wish they told me that that 40 milligram pill would eventually turn to 1,600 milligrams a day. I wish they told me that that little yellow pill in the palm of my hand, two years later, would turn into a syringe. And that syringe, that syringe would stay in my arm for the next eight years. I wish they told me that that syringe would make me spend every last dime I ever made playing basketball. I wish they told me that it would break my family's heart, make me sleep on the street, bring me to the brink of death, and cause me to attempt suicide. And there I was, eight years later, 32 years old, in handcuffs, in a hospital in Fargo, Massachusetts, where I was born. And when I came through, the police officer said, don't say a word, Chris. You were just dead 30 seconds ago. He explained to me that while driving, I overdosed. I went through a lane of traffic, I jumped a curb, and I crashed into a cemetery fence. He explained to me that, that they brought me back to life that day. And a nurse practitioner walked into that room, and she shined a light in my eyes, she took my blood pressure. And she said, he's free to go. He's all yours. The police officer looked at me and said, Chris, man, when we were in high school, I would have never imagined this would be your story. I can't believe this is how it turned out. 
So what I want to do is I want to do you a favor today. I want to uncuff you. I want to summon you. But you got to promise me one thing. In the next 30 days, you'll che check into a treatment center. And when that 30 days is up, you'll turn yourself into the judge. I looked at that police officer, and I said, bet. He uncuffed me, handed me my summons. And as I was walking out of that hospital, I said to myself, since 18 years old, I've been nothing but a failure. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to walk out of this hospital. I'm going to walk to my friend's house. I'm going to grab his gun. I'm going to stick it in my mouth. And I'm going to blow my head off. At 32 years old, I will end this nightmare for everybody involved. And as I'm walking out of that hospital that I was born in, thinking about ending my life, a nurse yelled my name, and that nurse said, Christopher, please come back. When I turned around, she was in her 50s, and I waved her off, and I kept walking. She said, please don't wave me off. I went to high school with your mother. My mom died at a young age. I turned around, I said, ma'am, please don't talk about my mom right now. She said, I have no choice because your mother's talking to me right now, telling me to help her little baby. So will you please let me do your mom that favor? I turned around, I walked back in, I sat with that woman that she called treatment centers all over Massachusetts, saying I got a former Boston Celtic with no money, no job, two kids. Will you please give him a free bed? Everybody said no. Until this one center finally said, we'll give him five days. Eight years on heroin, I got five days of care. And on day five, I was being discharged. And as I was walking out, still sick, still withdrawing, thinking about getting high, my phone rang. And on the other line, it was Liz Mullen. Liz Mullen is Chris Mullen's wife, the NBA Hall of Famer. I lived with them for three weeks to get ready for the NBA draft, and Liz Mullen simply said, we have the resources. We want to send you to send you to a treatment center in New York for six months. Will you please take our gift? I took the gift. At 32, I was out of choices. I jumped in a car, I drove to Rhinebeck, New York, I checked in, and I was told that the first 30 days, you can't have contact with your family. On day 30, they called me into the office for my phone call. When I called my wife, all she said was, can you go home? I'm going into, I'm going into labor. See, when I was found on the side of the road, my wife was eight months pregnant expecting our third child. I looked at my counselor and I said, can I go home? He said, bad idea. I said, sir, please. At 22, I was on Oxycontin for little Chris. At 24, I was on heroin for Sam. Please let me see one of my children come into this world sober. That man gave me a chance. He called me a taxi and four hours later, I witnessed my son Drew come into this world. I sat with that little baby sober and proud for about eight hours. And when that eight hours ended, I told my wife, I'll be right back. I'm going for a walk. I never came back. I walked right out of that hospital, walked up to a liquor store, bought two pints of vodka, jumped on the phone, called my heroin dealer. He picked me up and I was gone. 30 days earlier, I was found dead on the side of the road. 30 days later, I'm back on the same streets. When I walked into that hospital the next morning, my wife took one look at me. She shook her head and she said, don't ever come back. See, I met my wife in the seventh grade. She knew me long before heroin and hoop. My wife said, you broke my heart a million times, but this is the last time I let you do it to my children. I walked out of that hospital. I went back to that place in Rhinebeck, New York, and when I walked in the front door, that man who said it was a bad idea to come home, he said, Mr. Heron, come into my office. I heard about your, your home visit. I said, if you heard, there's nothing to talk about. I lost my family. He said, of course you did. That's what addiction does. It ruins families. I walked out of his office, and he said, Mr. Heron, be in my office at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock tonight. I'm going to help you with this. All day I wondered, and at 10 I knocked. He called. I walked in. He flipped me a cell phone. I caught it. He said, now you're going to do the most courageous, admirable thing you've ever done in your life. You're going to flip that phone open. You're going to call your wife. And you're going to promise her that you'll disappear. Tell your wife this will be the last phone call you ever make to her. And then tell your wife to tell your three kids when daddy, when daddy left them in the hospital this morning, that daddy died in a car accident. 
you're going to play dead for these kids, Chris. And you're going to let your family live. Because you're a no good scumbag, washed up junkie, who doesn't deserve a family. And I looked at that man and that broke my soul. I started crying. I flipped him back the phone. And I said, I've been calling myself. I've been calling myself that for the last 10 years. I know who I am. I'll be in your office first thing in the morning to make the phone call. I walked out of that office in tears, went back to my room, and what seemed to be the worst day of my life is not one of my best. Because I opened that door, I hit my knees, and I started praying. I started asking God for help. And that day, I hit my knees was August 1st, 2008. And by the grace of God, August 1st, 2008 is my sobriety date. I thank God every day. I thank God every day for that man's words. I thank God every day for that nurse who chased me out. At almost five years sober and 37 years old, I'm grateful for my bad days. People often ask me, aren't you tired of doing this? Too emotional? Of course. But I believe in it. And I believe it's necessary. See, I spoke at a school an hour and a half from here. And as I presented to these 2,000 kids, Afterwards, I shook hands, I took pictures, I walked out, I got in my car, and as I'm leaving, my phone buzzed. When I opened it, dear Mr. Heron, I'm still in the bleaches. I'm still in the bleaches with my boyfriend. In our backpack, two bottles of vodka. In our backpack, Tylenol, Xanax. In our pockets, our suicide notes. Today, we were going home to kill ourselves. But today you came to my school. Today you gave me hope. So today, we're walking down to the principal's office to tell on ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Heron, for coming to my school and sharing your story. I spoke at a school in Rhode Island where these four kids walked in in purple shirts. And this little girl raised her hand, and I called on her. She stood up. Nobody really stands up. She, she stood up. It took me by surprise. And when she stood up, she said, I don't have... I don't have a question, but I have a statement. My statement is this. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart coming to my high school and validating what me and my friends do. And she pointed to the four purple shirts. I said, what do you do? She said, we're the sober students of this high school. And as I looked at this girl with such admiration, courage, I heard laughter. And two seconds later, the whole school was laughing at her. So this little girl sat down, started crying, turned beet red. I looked at those kids and I said, for real? And at 35 years old, I looked back at that girl. And the only words that could come out of my mouth that day was, I wish. I wish I liked myself enough. I wish I never had to change myself. I wish I never had to put a substance in my body and become somebody different to fit in. I looked at that little girl and I said, I'd give you every uniform I put on in my life to go back to 15, 16, 17, sit in that front row and wear that purple shirt proud. And from that little girl, I started this thing called Project Purple. And Project Purple is a little anti-substance abuse campaign that we launched nine months ago. And within nine months, we got 100,000 kids to sign up. We got 100,000 kids walk into their school wearing purple. Project Purple is about raising awareness, educating our youth, empowering them to stand up for what is right. It's about raising their self-worth and their self-esteem. It's about letting our kids know to never change who they are for nobody because they're perfect just the way they are. See, over the last three years, I've continued this mission, and it's never easy. I can cry. My audience, my game has changed. The kids in the bleachers, they're not there to heckle or to taunt. Hopefully, they're there to listen to learn and to be inspired to share their struggle. Because what I found out, in our struggle, we can find our greatest strength. Today, today I'm sober, first and foremost. Today I'm a father, 
of four beautiful kids. I'm a husband to the star of this story, my wife, Heather. We've been married 15 years. I'm an author, a speaker. I'm a voice for the kids who cut, who burn, who are bullied. I'm a voice for the millions out there who are still sick and still suffering. Hopefully, I'm a game changer. Today, I'm grateful for everything that I've lost, and I'm grateful for everything that I've gained. I found my soul on this journey. I found my purpose in life. Is today your bottom or your beginning? And I will leave you with this. If you were a kid, would you look up to you? Thank you. God bless.